Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Today we have a special, big, deep dive episode into the U.S.-China relationship, looking at all sorts of fronts in this relationship, from trade, technology, economy, military, soft power, diplomacy, and general relations. Because it does look like Xi Jinping and Biden will be meeting next week, I think now is probably the best time to really do a deep dive into the nature of this relationship, where they are at the moment across all these different fronts. This was a lot of work, a huge amount of work putting this episode together, but it was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoy putting it together. If you do get some value from the episode, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are all big helps, especially sharing this uh, this video with people who you think would like it. It's the main way that this channel can grow and be introduced to new people. And Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below for anyone who can provide financial support. I rely primarily on subscriber support to keep going and keep producing these episodes every day, open for all for free. Okay, now without any further ado, let's jump into today's special episode of China Update. Let's jump in. As of yesterday, Friday, both the governments of the PRC and the United States have now officially confirmed that, as anticipated, General Secretary Xi Jinping will travel to San Francisco next week for APEC, where he will have an in-person meeting with President Biden, the leader's first such meeting since November 2022. The meeting is scheduled for the 15th of November. At a press event in Tokyo, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken expressed, quote, We both agree that we have an obligation, the United States and China, to responsibly manage the relationship, and that really, in many ways, starts and finishes with leader-level engagement. End quote. However, he did not provide specifics regarding what would be discussed. U.S. outlet Axios reports, citing three unnamed sources, that the leaders are preparing to announce the resumption of military-to-military communications between the two countries. Erecting these important guardrails have been a priority of the U.S. side for months now, and with growing tensions in the East and South China Seas, are urgently needed. On Thursday, 13 Republicans in the House of Representatives Bipartisan Select Committee on China, led by Chairman Mike Gallagher, published an open letter to Biden crediting his administration for strengthening uh, semiconductor export controls and restrictions on outbound investment towards China, but urged him to present Xi with a list of 10 demands to improve relations, just like Beijing did to the U.S. back in 2021. Long time China Update viewers will remember that we covered that at the time. Their demands include that China release all Americans the US considers wrongfully detained, take measures over the flow of chemicals used to make fentanyl, cease unsafe intercepts of US ships and aircraft in international waters, and stop the harassment of Philippine ships in the South China Sea, a topic which we will cover in a special Sunday video tomorrow. This week has seen the publication of many state media articles and special commentaries unpacking Beijing's official grievances and demands of the U.S. side in order to stabilize and improve relations. As usual, it is important that we take note of some of these uh, articles and the language that's employed to get a sense of the elite worldview in China, as well as what is being consumed domestically. In a commentary posted on the social media account of China Central Television, Beijing complained about what it said was the lack of a level playing field for firms investing in the U.S. and the sanctioning of more than 1,300 entities. The commentary said U.S. economic policy was dominated by hegemonic thinking, a term which is very familiar to regular viewers. It also complained the U.S. was fabricating a false narrative that Beijing entrapped developing nations with, quote, so-called debt trap diplomacy, end quote. State-run Global Times published a special editorial claiming, quote, there is a dark force in Washington that is undermining U.S.-China relations, and the more critical the moment, the more active they become. The White House has limited control over them. We hope that the U.S. can use political wisdom and courage to prevent China-U.S. relations from being hijacked by a small number of extremist voices and adopt a truly responsible strategy toward China. 
end quote. According to US-based Pew Research data published in July this year, 83% of US adults have unfavorable views of China. So it may not be as small a number of anti-China voices as the state-run Global Times supposes. Also this week, state-run Xinhua launched a series called Commentaries on Bringing China-US Relations Back on Track. So far, it has published two articles in this series, and a common theme has already appeared putting all the blame, as usual, of the current poor relations on the U.S. side and arguing that the onus is on the U.S. to change its behavior and improve the relationship. For example, the first article titled, Returning to Bali, Heading to San Francisco, writes, quote, The practice of saying one thing and doing another has led China-U.S. relations down a winding path, also forcing the international community, including China, to question the political integrity and diplomatic effectiveness of the United States. End quote. The second installment, titled Three Major Marks for Setting Course of the Giant Ship of U.S.-China Relations, repeats the sentiment, writing, quote, The reasons for the downturn in the U.S.-China relationship are clear. Whether it's the neglect of mutual dependence between the two countries, the distortion of the history of cooperation and win-win, the blocking of dialogue and communication channels, or defining and affecting U.S.-China relations in a dangerous manner of so-called strategic competition that brings huge uncertainties to the future of both peoples and the world, the root cause is the U.S.'s misperception of China, the world, and itself. End quote. In a speech uh, this week, PRC ambassador to the United States, Xie Feng, laid out China's specific demands, namely, do not seek a change in the Chinese system, do not seek a new Cold War, do not support Taiwan independence, do not seek decoupling from China, and do not obstruct China's economic development. While Washington, officially at least, through various senior officials, has repeatedly stated that it does not intend to do any of these, the tension stems from how these so-called do-nots are defined and the size of their scope. For example, the U.S. provision of Taipei with defensive weapons is seen by regional actors in Washington as a means of ensuring the peaceful status quo, but seen by Beijing as interference. Technology restrictions and de-risking is seen by Washington as a legitimate national security policy, but Beijing argues that it unfairly infringes on China's, quote, right to economic development. End quote. These and many others will be the details that both sides will discuss and debate in San Francisco next week, and which we will follow closely as they unfold. Next up, we examine developments in trade and technology. US-based The Wall Street Journal produced an excellent piece yesterday examining the economic side of the bilateral relationship, writing that US officials hope to learn more about how China plans to address its economic slowdown. The American concern, it writes, is that Beijing will focus solely on steps such as cutting interest rates, which boost China's exports and undercuts U.S. companies. Treasury officials said they plan to suggest that Beijing offer direct financial support to households to stimulate growth, though Chinese officials have not embraced such moves. Quote, having an honest discussion is in some ways more important than the usual deliverables everyone asks for. A substantive dialogue about broader economic policies is actually more important. End quote. On Thursday this week, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jeanette Yellen met with Chinese Vice Premier He Lifeng. He told his U.S. counterpart, quote, I would like to take this opportunity to communicate with you, Madam Secretary, some of our key concerns in the economy so as to create a better investment and business environment for enterprises of our two countries and to also take effective measures to bring our economic and trade relations back on track. End quote. Yellen replied, Quote, a full separation of our economies would be economically disastrous for both of our countries and for the world. We seek a healthy economic relationship with China that benefits both countries over time. End quote. Meanwhile, UK-based The Financial Times writes this week that, quote, Western businesses flock back to Shanghai trade fair despite tensions. End quote. Quoting Nicholas Burns, the U.S. ambassador to China at the China International Import Expo in Shanghai this week, is saying, quote, We have the largest number of businesses and exhibitions this year. That's more than any other country. The U.S. delegation is here to show our commitment to the overall relationship between the United States and China. End quote. 
While these are all positive and diplomatic words, the reality is that bilateral trade as a percentage of overall trade has seen a years-long decline as supply chains decouple, companies diversify, US capital leaves, and government restrictions from both sides are put in place. And on this theme, NVIDIA's cat and mouse game with Washington to continue selling to the Chinese continues this week. The American technology giant is rolling out AI chips for the PRC market that are just below the thresholds in the recently updated semiconductor controls. UK-based The Financial Times writes that NVIDIA has developed three new chips tailored for China that aim to meet the region's growing demand for artificial intelligence technology while complying with US export controls, according to leaked documents and four people familiar to the situation speaking to the outlet. The outlet writes, quote, The latest efforts mark the second time in little more than a year that the Silicon Valley-based NVIDIA has been forced by new U.S. regulations to reconfigure its products for Chinese customers as it strives to maintain its foothold in the most important markets. The overall performance of these chips has been moderated compared with those that NVIDIA had previously sold in China. Nonetheless, the new graphics processing units were expected to remain competitive in the Chinese market. End quote. In a note to clients on Thursday, chip consultancy Semi Analysis wrote, quote, NVIDIA is perfectly straddling the line on peak performance and performance density with these new chips to get them through the new US regulations. End quote. Dylan Patel, an analyst with this uh, consultancy Semi Analysis, in a separate statement this week expressed, quote, when the U.S. dropped the updated AI restrictions, we thought the U.S. locked down every single loophole conceivable. To our surprise, NVIDIA still found a way to ship high-performance GPUs into China with their upcoming H20, L20, and L2 GPUs. NVIDIA already has product samples for these GPUs, and they will go into mass production within the next month. Yet again, showing their supply chain mastery. End quote. Next up, and finally for today's special US China relations video, we look at soft power competition. This week, US based Pew Research published new numbers for a large survey conducted in 24 countries examining, quote, how the U.S. and China stack up to one another on more than 10 different measures, spanning from confidence in their leaders to views on their universities and technological achievements, focused on the difference in how people across these countries see the two superpowers, end quote. Let us examine some of these findings, which we are now quoting selected excerpts of Directly. On balance, views of the US are much more positive than views of China, and increasingly so. Opinion skews towards the US most heavily in the high income countries surveyed. The differences of 50 percentage points or more in favor of the US in Poland, Japan, and South Korea. In all three countries, more than 7 in 10 offer positive rating to the US, and fewer than 3 in 10 have favorable opinions of China. In most middle-income countries surveyed, views of both powers are generally positive, leading to a smaller difference in views. Nigeria is the lone public surveyed with warmer opinions of China than of the U.S., though both the U.S. and China receive positive ratings from large majorities of Nigerians. The U.S. economy is larger than China's, but has tended to grow less per year, at least until recently. Still, the U.S. is considered by most surveyed publics to be the world's leading economic power. And in many countries, the sense is growing. In Sweden, for example, 51% now say that the U.S. is the leading economy, compared with 39% in 2020, when they were more likely to give the title to China. South Koreans are especially likely to see the U.S. as the world's top economy, with 83% giving the title to the U.S. compared with just 8% to China. Sizable differences of around 40 percentage points in favor of the U.S. are also seen in Japan, Poland, Israel, and India. Still, five countries, most of which are in Europe, see China as the leading economy. This includes Italy, which is the only country where a majority considers China the world's leading economy. Now, this is where things get interesting. We continue to quote the Pew Research. The U.S. and China are both widely seen as technological powerhouses. For example, together they dominate the global digital economy. Between Google's, Android, and Apple's iOS, 
American companies have the vast majority of the mobile operating system market share worldwide. Yet, China leads the charge toward 5G and global network coverage. Across the 24 countries surveyed, a median of 72% describe US technology as the best or above average, and 69% say the same of Chinese technology. And evaluations of the two superpowers' technological prowess differ little in several countries. For example, 83% of Spaniards say American technology is above average or the best, compared with 82% who say the same for China. Respondents in 12 countries further evaluated technology from the US and China on their quality and other attributes. Roughly three quarters or more in each country surveyed say American products are well made. China's technology gets more variable ratings. The US and China are home to two of the world's largest militaries. China's active forces are nearly double the size of the United States's, though the US outspends China on defense. Majorities in every country surveyed say the American military is above average or the best, while the same is only true for China in about half of the countries surveyed. In most countries surveyed, the US military receives significantly higher ratings than China's. There are three exceptions. In Germany, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, all NATO allies of the US. The United States' and China's militaries are about equally likely to be considered above average or the best. However, the US military gets more recognition than China's when considering only those who say each is the best. And on the topic of military power, the US also gets higher marks for contributing to global peace and stability than China does. And differences in evaluations are often 30 points or more. The difference is greatest in Japan, where 79% say the US contributes at least a fair amount to international stability, and just 14% say the same of China, a difference of 65 points. While still large in many countries, differences are smaller in many middle-income countries. And in Indonesia and Hungary, US and Chinese contributions to global peace and stability are seen in a similar light. The Pew Research Survey then turns to culture and education. US entertainment, including its music, movies, and television, is more than four times more likely to be seen as the best or above average than China's. A 24-country median of 71% versus 17%, respectively. High-income countries view American entertainment more favorably than middle-income countries. The sub-Saharan African publics surveyed offer the highest praise for Chinese entertainment, especially in Nigeria, where 67% say it is the best or above average. Even so, each public gives U.S. entertainment higher ratings. Across the 24 countries surveyed, a median of 68% say U.S. universities are above average or the best, while just 35% say the same of China's. Universities in the U.S. receive significantly more positive ratings than universities in China in all countries surveyed. Middle-income countries give both countries' universities some of the most favorable evaluations, but the gap in the ratings of the two are similar to the gaps seen in high-income countries. Though ratings of both vary greatly, greater shares say that the standard of living in the U.S. is above average or the best in every country surveyed. In several high-income countries, ratings of the standard of living are low for both the U.S. and China. For example, just 16% of Germans see the standard of living in the U.S. as above average or the best, and 8% say the same of China. In a survey of 17 high-income publics, the US government was far more likely than the Chinese government to be seen as respecting its people's personal freedoms. The previous surveys of both high- and middle-income countries have recorded similar findings. The US government was seen as more respectful of its people's personal freedoms than China's, even as it received increasingly negative ratings between 2013 and 2018. And finally, we started today's video with news of the Biden-Xi meeting next week, so it's fitting that we end with these survey data here. When it comes to leaders, global publics are nearly three times more likely to have confidence in US President Joe Biden than in Chinese leader Xi Jinping. Medians across 23 countries, not including the US, of 54% and 19% respectively. Each country surveyed is more likely to have confidence in Biden than Xi, but this has not always been the case for ratings of the US president. Views of Biden and Xi differ across high and middle income countries. Those in middle income countries are more likely to rate Biden and Xi similarly. For example, 71% of Nigerians have confidence in Biden, while 62% say they have the same of Xi. A nine point 
difference. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Saturday. Have a good, relaxing weekend. There will probably be an extra episode tomorrow because there is still more to cover. So I hope to see many of you tomorrow.